My father took a job here in 1932. I was eight years old, moved here. So I grew up here in El Paso. I finished high school here and joined the Navy, right, during the war, 1942. Uh, my father had been in the hotel business and in the restaurant business. Uh, not in the restaurant business at that time, but at, in the hotel. And uh, he uh, was on the way to California during the Depression. And he got off the train here to see Hilton, and he took a job, and that's how we arrived in El Paso. That's a, yeah. Wow. And your family's originally from which, which city in Germany? Uh, Epping, Eppingen, yeah. And what's that near? Uh, well, it's... Near Heidelberg. It, it's, um, yeah, it's in that same area, the uh, Black Forest area thing. It's very, very nice in there. Yeah. Okay. And then, uh, so when your dad set up ship here, tell me about the different places he owned around town and stuff. Well, he, uh, he was, uh, he and Harry Hussman Sr., well, no, Harry Hussman Jr., really, uh, were good friends. And the Hussmans at that time owned the Cortez Hotel. It was called the Hussman at that time. And also, uh, Harry Jr. was in the hotel and restaurant supply business. They became very good friends, and he helped him, uh, you know, finance uh, the first restaurant here. And so he was in the restaurant business here from 1932 to until he passed away, and and he, at age 80, 86. And the last restaurant he had was at the Caballero Motel. Hotel. That's that was his life here. What was the restaurant called? It was the Caballero. Oh, okay, right. the Caballero. Pretty, pretty popular place? Yeah, very. Uh -huh. It was very nice. Back in the day. And, uh... It's not there anymore. Caballero's gone. And tell me, uh, you, were, you were mentioning, you know, growing up here, you could pop over to Juarez and... Juarez was an open, <laughs> open city <laughs> at that time. Uh, the kids used to go there a lot. Yeah, sure. And so by the time you got out into to the Navy, with all these farm boys, they, uh... Yeah. <laughs> Well, it was all new to them, you know, San Diego, you know, but it was fun. I met some very nice guys in, in, the, in the service. Well, I had just uh, turned 18 and uh, I volunteered for the Navy and September the, I, I thought I was going to go into the signal uh, corps, I guess you'd call it, uh, as a radio, radio man. Uh, I took the test for that and passed everything fine. But meanwhile, uh, they said they were very so short on medics. And did I know anything about that? And I said, well, I've taken a course in life. I was a lifeguard. That's good. <laughs> and they, and then that's what happened. And so I went through a boot camp in San Diego. And then I was assigned to the Naval Hospital in San Diego interviewing naval families for medical purposes. And I didn't like that idea at all. At eight, age 18, I wanted to see some activity, more than Navy families <laughs> interviewing. And so I asked for a transfer to anything. And they said, well, the only thing open would be the Fleet Marine Force. I said, okay, that's okay with me. And they said, well, are you crazy? <laughs> so I finally got a transfer to the 3rd Marine Division. It was also in the San Diego area. So I trained with the 3rd Marine Division. And out of that, they chose, I don't know, maybe 10 of us to for a separate unit. And I shipped out right away. I was, went, went overseas to Numia, New, New Caledonia, uh, right away, and then finally after Guadalcanal, and uh, we formed the Navy, uh, the Navy uh, medical facility for supplies. So we supplied the Third Fleet, uh, Admiral Halsey, with all his medical stuff, plus the first Marine Division that was also there. They had, they had won Guadalcanal in that battle. And <clears throat> so I, I was there for uh, about a year and a half. 
And uh, after that time, they started what they call rotation. So I asked if we could get back to, I was transferred into the Marine Corps. Now I want to go back to the Navy and go, go back to the States. And uh, uh, we, we, somehow we got lucky. Uh, there were three or four of us had been there all that time. And we were reassigned to the 12th Naval District in San, San Francisco. And from that point on, I was sent to the Naval Air Station in, in uh, Key West, Florida, and then to a ship uh, called the ATR-29, it was a seagoing tug. Uh, they don't have medical personnel on those except one pharmacist mate. That's it. And uh, then uh, finally, uh, I went, after I'd been on independent duty, then they sent me to school for independent duty. <laughs> <laughs> and I was assigned to uh, a ship that was going to be a troop ship, but it, it had been a refrigeration ship, and supposed to bring back troops. The war was over now, bring back troops from Europe. Well, I found the ship finally. It was in Seattle, in dry dock. I never got out of it. <laughs> we were towed back down to San Francisco and put it in moth mothballs. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's two islands in that, the Solomon Island chain. One of them is Tulagi, and the other was Guadalcanal. And the Marines uh, landed in, in Tulagi, which was a beautiful natural port, uh, deep water ships, uh, on August 7th, 1942. And they took that right away. And then on August 9th, they attacked Guadalcanal. America launches its first amphibious assault of World War II. Over 11,000 U.S. Marines storm ashore at Guadalcanal. They were under a lot of bombardment from the Japanese Navy at that time and Air Force. And uh, they finally got off the beaches and, uh, and took uh, the air airport is what they wanted. Uh, Henderson Field it was called. They took that and then they had to hold on to it and for a long time. And we arrived after most of the, well, all the hand-to-hand -hand stuff was gone, but uh, we were bombed a lot, uh, a lot of air activity. So, tell me, what's going through your mind with the bombs, that first bomb hits? Well, uh, uh, find shelter <laughs> somewhere. But I did see one heck of an air battle. Uh, we were attacked uh, one day for, I think there were over a hundred uh, Japanese uh, planes. And I saw 97 of them shot down over, well, 77 overhead. And 20 more on the way back to Rabul. Uh, and I think we lost seven, something like that. Uh, yeah. And as an army medic, is it Army Corpsman? You're a medic. Is it Army Corpsman? Uh, no, you were a you were Marine. Excuse me about this. Yeah, time. Navy Corpsman. Yeah. Who, did you work on some of the injured, the wounded? No, the wounded? we we did uh, all the supply business. Oh, ah, we, okay, okay. You know, we received all these supplies to so we could supply the Third Fleet and the, all Marine divisions that were in the area. You know, when you look back now, like you're in one of the most historic battles in right. the history of American warfare, certainly. Right. First time the Japanese had really been defeated in a long time. A long time. I don't know how many thousand years, but a long time. Yeah. You know, I mentioned my I mentioned my grandma a few times, but she was living in Queens for five years while my grandfather was at sea. You know, he's in uh -huh. the Coast Guard of the Navy. And um, uh, I said, Grandma, what was it like? And she just true to form, she said, It was war, boy. <laughs> that was her whole answer. But you know, when you look back, how does it strike you? When you think of that whole experience, how does it strike you? Well, it's, uh, that's, uh, you go where they send you, and that's it. So, uh, we did have, uh, from time to time, we, we sent some people that were working with us uh, to fill in for casualties. Uh, medic, medics in the Marine Corps were uh, pretty well targeted. Uh, they were easy to to pick up because they carried two packs instead of just normal. And they were also armed. 
because the Japanese did not uh, abide by the uh, Geneva Convention. So they would they, they shot at medics as, as well. We wore no we wore no insignia that, insignia that would be identifiable except the pack, and they caught on to that pretty quick. What was different? We were all volunteers. That's different. We weren't drafted. The Navy didn't take draftees until later, but at that time it was all Marine Corps was always volunteer, always. So, so they were, what would you call it, a gung ho bunch. They were. Yeah. I never heard anybody complain. Oh, you hear complain about food once in a while, but <laughs> nothing, nothing, nothing really particular. They were there for to do their job, and they did it very well. Yeah. Uh, what did, uh, what did, you know, I, I mean, I, I would get the sense, you know, and my grandfather was one of those people, he, you know, he say, well, they don't, they really don't want to talk about it. He was really that way. He really didn't want to talk about it. Well, there's nothing to, what are you going to say, you know? And, you know uh, it's very hard to reenact uh, some of that stuff. I mean, uh, an air raid is an air raid. <laughs> that's, that's it. <laughs> Uh, we, I did see, I also saw uh, uh, the first night fighter shoot down two Japanese bombers. Uh, I saw tracers. What had happened, uh, all these searchlights are out looking for them, and uh, everything went dark, everything off. So those, those planes were uh, apparently uh, equipped with radar. And all of a sudden you see Tracers going through the air and boom. And that happened twice. What was the moment where you you knew that the war was done, maybe that we had won? You know, what kind of what what what, what, what went through your mind? Well, I, I was just naval reserve. I was waiting to get out <laughs> at that time. <laughs> I wanted to go back to school. And that, that. Do you remember where you heard the news? Uh, and, what, and what did you hear that made you say, ah? the war's going to be over soon? Well, uh, the first news we got that was a little bit, uh, I said, shouldn't say a little bit, was depressing, was that uh, Franklin Roosevelt died. And uh, he, he had been, uh, well, a very, a very important uh, uh, person, in, uh, you know, in, in the war. I do remember when D-Day hit. Uh, I was in Espirito Santos, which is another in the New Hebrides, uh, uh, in a poker game. And we heard that the Normandy beaches were hit. Yeah, it was on the radio. And I thought, well, if that's successful, that's, that's the end, the beginning of the end. Right. And it was successful, yeah. And you were in the, some of the islands? I was in, yeah, in the New Hebrides. Where are the New Hebrides at? Uh, south of the Solomons. Okay. So Which, you're in a poker game and over the radio you hear yeah, D-Day. Right. Were you all just at that point, the poker game ends and you're all like... No, the poker game <laughs> continued. <laughs> Another day at the ranch. <laughs> You know, how, do you, how did uh, having that experience, being a, a World War II veteran, kind of impact you over, over your life? Well, it does. It uh, also teaches you what it means to be uh, uh, involved in uh, a major part of history. It is, yeah. That's always in the back of your mind. I mean, you, you can make comparisons and whatever, but uh, that, was, that was a very... A decisive thing for 18-year-old boys, for sure. Yeah. So I was discharged the fifth day of February, 1946. Even if you have the last word, you know, even if you have the last word, don't use it. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> don't, don't win this argument. Just leave it alone. <laughs> you know, this is a, a kind of a, almost a hard, kind of a, it's kind of an awkward question, but you know, you are the uh, part of a, a 
small group of World War II vets that are dying out. We all talk about it every year, especially yeah. around Memorial Year. And pretty soon we're not going to talk about it anymore. Well, we're in our 90s now, so most of us. Yeah. Or pretty soon will be. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. But I, th I think we've lived a good life, most of us, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I have no regrets of that of that wartime years. No, I think it it it, it, it was a, a great teacher as well. Uh, I mean, to get along with other people, even if you disagree with them, uh, to, to learn how to to get along with it. Yeah. You, you know, and uh, what, what, uh, what was? It sounds oversimplified, but just in a nutshell, what was that war about? Well, it was uh, dictatorships, fascists, uh, and, and even the <laughs> communists. Uh, the big fight in Germany, of course, and resulted in Adolf Hitler and Mussolini in, in Italy. And the Japanese also with their mil militant uh, stance in the, in the Far East. I guess like from this kind of, you know, a kind of a haymaker, you, you ask people what the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq are about, you get answers all over the place. Yeah. It's political, it's oil, it's blah, 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 blah. But I, I get the feeling that like with World War II, it just it was real clear. To stop them, yeah. We, we had to stop them. And the amazing thing was that when all the smoke cleared, the Marshall Plan rebuilt everybody. That's the best thing that ever happened, really. We made lots of good friends with that. We held no hostility toward anybody, really. God, our current leaders could just, I wish they could emulate a lot of that. Oh yeah, you know. sure. Well, uh, George C. Marshall was one heck of a, he, he should have been president of the United States, really, at, at one time, after Roosevelt. Well, she was, uh, she did that. Uh, she taught uh, mathematics at, uh, mostly at Coronado, but 17 years at Coronado. And then she heard that they needed uh, a better math department at uh, Bowie. So she volunteered to move to go to Bowie and teach. Uh, she had picked up Spanish very quickly here. So she could converse with people that didn't speak English well enough to explain a problem or whatever. And uh, so she, I think she was at Bui for five years or so. Uh, but altogether, she, 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 uh, she, she was a, a math teacher for a, a long, long time before she retired. And then after she retired, I put her to work. <laughs> and and uh, meanwhile, every summer for 22 years, she took students all over the world. And, tell, and your work, tell me again, uh, your uh, the, restaurant. The restaurant was on the corner of Montana and Chelsea. I was there 35 years. And uh, I, I would go with her once in a while. Uh, couldn't leave the business every year, but uh, I must have gone eight or nine times with her, you know, on, on those trips. Um, whenever my grandfather was, was dying, uh, I mean, this just came to me, but I remember my grandmother grabbing his hand, saying, his name was Harry. We did good, Harry. We did good. Uh -huh. I always remember that. You know, when you look back at your life, is it 89, 89? Do you feel like, you know, you've done what you, you know, lived a good life, done what you wanted to do? Yeah. How do you, when you look back over your life, what do you see, what kind of, what well, hits you in the heart, I guess? Well, I've done, I did what I wanted to do, and I did some things that I really didn't want to do, but... <laughs> But that happens too. But uh, no, uh, I think I was very fortunate. I had a very good marriage, uh, and that's the key to the whole thing, really. That's the key. If you have a good foundation, a good home, <clears throat> you can do a, a lot of things. Yeah, you know, one of the first things you said to me yesterday over the phone was, "My wife recently passed," You're right. and it kind of hit me. I thought. You know, that's, uh, it just seemed heavy, you know, like you still... Oh well, yeah, it's, it's a very difficult thing. You married 63 years, you know. Uh, that's your partner in life, you know, so. But uh, you have to be, you have to embrace your mortality. Mm -hmm.
Okay, you do. We all got to go sometime. So, if you, uh, I've heard it stated, if you don't embrace your mortality, you die a thousand deaths. Yeah. You miss her. I can see it in your eyes. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, <clears throat> there's nothing I can do about it. Then that's it. Right. Um, I was. Uh... But I, I will say this, uh, my children have been very, very attentive. I, I've really, they have really done a, 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 a wonderful thing for me. I mean, they really made me feel uh, wanted by the family and desired. Just, they've been just wonderful, all of them. It's mm. probably no, uh, no coincidence. I imagine you were a pretty damn good dad to them growing up. Well, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> well, the work ethic was good at that time. Everybody did what they were told to do or asked to do and did it well. And if they didn't know how to do it, they'd find out how to do it. <clears throat> yeah. It was, a, it was a, good, a very good lesson to young, young people at that time. And we learned a lot from, <clears throat> from our peers. Well, that sure made you grow up quick. It did. Oh, yeah. Uh, one day you're in El Paso or San Diego. Next day you're... Now here comes an air raid. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> well, that's the way it was. And one one interesting thing, uh, drugs were no part of it at that time. Uh, we had built, oh, I think five big uh, Quonset uh, warehouses for all this medicine coming in. <clears throat> so there was one, one warehouse had a lot of drugs in it and alcohol. And uh, from time to time, it would be broken into, it would cut a hole in the roof somewhere, and some Marines would get it. They'd always go for the alcohol, never for the drugs. Never. Get the beer. <laughs> so, uh, now, now, you enlisted in the Navy, and right. you were in the Navy how many years? Just uh, four years, from 42 to 46. And, and does, does that four years include the Fleet Marines as yes, well? Yes, yeah. And the Fleet Marines were the Marine Corps. Yeah, right. So you did Navy and Marine Corps. And when did you join the, the Fleet Marines? Well... Almost well, right away? Or? Well, pretty close. I went through boot camp, then assigned to <clears throat> the Naval Hospital, and I volunteered for the Marine Corps there. Okay. Yeah. And then... Uh, and you got out in 46? 46. In 46. And so and I always said, you know. <clears throat> Went back to school, finished here. I was the last class of mines, Texas mines. Wow. 1949 was the last class. Wow. Yeah. Where was, where, and where was the Texas mines college? Yeah. UTEP. Oh, that was UTEP. Okay. And then it became Western? T Texas Western after that. Then UTEP. My wife graduated from Texas Western. You married a young one. Yeah. And... <clears throat> And then it turned to UTEP. But I think mines, they were always part of the university system. They didn't advertise it as such. Okay. It was Texas College of Mines and Metallurgy. And, and, then, and remind me, how many children? You have three sons? Three sons and a daughter. And, and what do they do? Well, <clears throat> Mark is still in the restaurant business. Restaurant, uh, an actor, two you, lawyers, and uh, a what, PA. <laughs> do I remember that correctly? Well, that's grandchildren. Oh, okay. <laughs> sons, uh, three sons, one still in the restaurant business in El Paso, and one lives in Los Angeles. He's uh, an actor, and the other one is a, uh, a consultant. He, he does, uh, uh, what, what would you call it? Uh, he's, he's a... Business consultant? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but he travels everywhere. Okay. They, he was with Procter and Gamble for a long time. Okay. And several Procter and Gamble people formed their own company, and uh, they became. Uh, Got the uh, uh, dad's uh, and granddad's entrepreneurial spirit. You're right. They did that. <laughs> yeah. And and he still does that. Okay. And, uh, <clears throat> and then when you left the military, you what was your rank? I was a pharmacist, mate, first class. Pharmacist, mate, mate first class, right. United States Navy. U.S. Navy. Okay. Oh, US Slash. Yeah, right. Okay. 
Okay, I think that's probably it. Okay. And then I get home and I remember something I forgot and I'll call you. Okay.